Just under 1,500 years ago, something terrifying happened to the world's climate. Something nobody could understand. The sun began to go dark. Rain the color of blood poured from the skies. Clouds of fine dust enveloped the earth. Winter gripped the land for two years. Then came drought, famine, plague, death. Whole cities were wiped out. Civilizations crumbled. And nobody knew what had happened. It was a catastrophe, a catastrophe that affected millions and millions of people all around the world. But what was it? The mid-sixth century catastrophe was the most important date in the history of the past 2,000 years. It really did lay the foundations of the world we live in today. For five years, in the attic of his unassuming suburban home, David Keyes, a writer on history and archaeology, has immersed himself in a worldwide investigation. He's consulted over 80 experts on drought, famine, floods, cosmic and ecological disasters, epidemics and ancient wars. He's scoured the annals and chronicles of the 6th and 7th centuries AD from all over the world. His book tells the story of a catastrophic climatic event buried in the heart of the Dark Ages, which Keyes believes totally altered the course of history. The mystery, which has so tantalized him, began at a conference on archaeology in 1994. One particular talk uh, really amazed me. It was a lecture given by a dendrochronologist, an expert in tree rings, called Mike Bailey. And he was giving a, a lecture about how all the tree rings in the world um, really went haywire somewhere in the middle of the 6th century. Thirty years ago, when he was a physics student, Professor Mike Bailey of Queen's University in Belfast pioneered a revolutionary idea in a totally different field to his own. He devised a computer system which would put trees to scientific use. He had realized that trees had the potential to become the silent witnesses of the world's changing weather, going back thousands of years. Every year, trees put on a new layer of growth within the bark. These layers show up as rings. Every ring varies in width. A wide ring is a year of good weather, a narrow ring a bad year. The pattern of wide and narrow rings is distinctive. Each ring sequence can be matched with the rings of previously felled trees and precisely dated. The computer program which matches the patterns of the rings was Mike Bailey's invention, and it's now used by laboratories all over the world. Over the last 30 years in Northern Europe, uh, a variety of people, ver a, ver a variety of laboratories, have set out and, and, and worked back from known filling dates, taking you back through long ring records of living trees, 
and then overlapping to patterns from historic buildings, for example, fitting together these sort of long ring patterns, going back hundreds and eventually thousands of years. It's by painstakingly analysing and overlapping the patterns of older and older trees that a complete, unbroken record of tree ring widths is built up. So you've got this sample with its very clear character change just here. When we processed another sample from the same building, we could see that it came originally from the same parent tree, and you could extend the pattern back from the first sample right back through to the beginning of this sample. Many, many samples have to be analysed by Mike Bailey's computer programme to get the average width for every year. It took 14 years to build up the complete data just for Irish oaks. This tree record is now telling Irish scientists what the weather was like every single year for the last seven and a half thousand years. If you think about that, um, that's an astonishing position to be in. We can interrogate for any calendar year in the last thousands of years what trees thought of their growth conditions over a big geographical area. That information simply didn't exist before. But what we're interested in is why did this tree go narrow at this point? and narrow again at this point. What, what, what is the environmental information which is actually stored in the patterns? David Keyes went to Ireland to see for himself the mysterious sixth century event stored in Mike Bailey's tree rings. Yeah, shuffle through here, David. It was ten years ago that Mike Bailey noticed his oak rings went abnormally narrow in the mid-6th century AD. Signs that something very powerful was stopping the trees growing. 539, 540, 41, 42, extremely narrow. Bailey then told Keyes of similar evidence from Europe, particularly from a colleague in Finland. He sees a really abrupt drop in 536, a bit of a recovery in 537 and 38, and then it drops dramatically into uh, 542. So you begin to see a pattern. And that pattern wasn't just confined to Ireland and Finland. By contacting other labs, David Keyes found that wherever you looked in the world, in the mid-sixth century, trees were having a terrible time. Foxtail pine rings from the Sierra Nevada mountains in California show that 535, 536 and 541 were three of the four worst years in the past two millennia. In Chile, Fitzroy trees record the greatest summer growth drop of the past 1600 years. In Siberia, a 20-year decline in tree growth in the 530s and 540s was the most serious in the past 1900 years. So why were the trees not growing? Was it dark, cold, natural pollution, or drought? For Mike Bailey, the answer lay in a microscopic examination of a 536 AD oak ring. Cells normally seen in winter were showing up in summer too. A colleague in Germany sent me this photograph of one of his German oaks. The tree puts on a line of these large spring vessels and it then puts on fine cell wood during the, 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 the summer and goes dormant and then it does again the next year. So each year's growth is from the beginning of one line of vessels to the beginning of the next. And in this year, the year 536, the vessels are enormously small and they're also distributed right through the summer. So there, it's widely reckoned that this phenomenon is due to frost damage. The implication from this kind of worldwide evidence was that the weather was extremely cold for long periods in the mid-6th century. Mike Bailey also had archaeological evidence from Ireland which backs this up. Much of the wood that he dated came from Cranachs, wooden island forts that people built as refuges in times of trouble and clan warfare. Bailey took keys to the remains of one in Loch Catherine near Omer 
to look at the submerged timbers that once formed the outer wall. My first inkling that there was something going on came from timbers specifically from sites like this. The mid-sixth century marks the beginning of the construction of Cranogs. Bailey believes that this was due to the hostile conditions stemming from the climatic disaster. When you look at the overall picture, there seems to be about a decade of really bad conditions, starting in 536 and running on to the mid-540s at least. Um, the implication from lots of bits of evidence is that it was extremely cold and that this reduced sunlight and cold caused crop failures. So basically people in an area like this were, would be forced back onto non-agricultural produce. They would be forced to fish, they would be forced to, uh, to hunt. And that would put a lot of strain on a population which was used to having agricultural produce to see them through the winters, for example. Um, so I think things would have been fairly bleak here. Keyes was now hooked, not just by the tree ring evidence that it was cold, but also by the fact that people seemed to be suffering too. His next step was to see whether there were any written accounts from the time of the climate falling apart. By far the greatest civilization of the 6th century was the Roman Empire. Rome had been sacked a hundred years earlier by Huns and Goths, but now the empire was resurgent with a new capital in Constantinople. Once again, it was the center of Mediterranean culture. By contacting classical scholars, Keyes unearthed many highly significant Roman accounts of bizarre weather. One eyewitness, a Syrian bishop, John of Ephesus, describes the extraordinary events during the years 535 and 536 AD. There was a sign from the sun, the like of which had never been seen or reported before. The sun became dark, and its darkness lasted for 18 months. Each day it shone for about four hours, and still this light was only a feeble shadow. Everyone declared that the sun would never recover its full light again. Historians of the 6th century empire do not usually record climatic events unless they are something really stupendous. A natural event like a comet will get mentioned. Now, in the 530s, the fact that John mentions a two-year dimming of the sun indicates that it was significant. John, writing in Constantinople, mentions it. Cassiodorus writing in Italy, he too refers to a dimming of the sun. We have had a spring without mildness and a summer without heat. The month, which should have been maturing the crops, have been chilled by north winds. Rain is denied and the reaper fears new frosts. These accounts from the Mediterranean and Middle East were extraordinary enough, but what about the other civilizations of that time? Keys scoured records from North and South China, Korea and Japan. And as it turned out, there the were out of, say, well over 30 um, sources, there were around a dozen which actually refer directly to the darkened sun event or uh, to its consequences, to its immediate climatic consequences. In 540, the Japanese great king wrote, Food is the basis of the empire. Yellow gold and 10,000 strings of cash cannot cure hunger. What avails a thousand boxes of pearls to him who is starving of cold? 
and the Nanshi ancient chronicle of southern China records. Yellow dust rained down like snow. It could be scooped up in handfuls. As the research continued, I began to realize more and more that this disaster had really uh, enveloped the entire world, that uh, it, it just wasn't just a few places, but it was virtually everywhere. The only question was, what was causing it? There seemed, in my mind, uh, only three possible answers to that. Uh, either an asteroid, or a comet, or a volcano. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Imagine living in the middle of the 6th century, suffering a climatic catastrophe. An event so horrendous that trees hardly grew for years, and the sun was dimmed. Whatever it was, it would have taken thousands of cubic miles of dust to be hurled into the atmosphere to cause this permanent winter. Was an asteroid, comet strike, or volcano responsible? At Los Alamos, the birthplace of the atomic bomb, scientists have been studying all the possible atmospheric consequences of nuclear strikes and cosmic collisions. We certainly have plenty of evidence that the Earth is struck repeatedly by asteroids large and small, comets large and small. You have to have a big thing that hits the ground in order to have a climate effect. Extraterrestrial bodies come in all shapes and sizes. Meteors are small rocks which roam space, occasionally hitting planets, usually causing little damage. Asteroids are big meteors. When these things hit the Earth's surface, they explode, churning up vast amounts of dust and debris. David Keyes asked an astrophysicist to calculate how big an impact would have been needed to generate a climatic catastrophe lasting at least a decade. And so what we can say is that the total number of particles in the atmosphere, because this is one, then rho is around one over kappa L. To cause a major climatic catastrophe that would last decades, we would need an impact by a rather large asteroid, say four kilometers across. It would take an even bigger comet to create the same effect. A comet consists mainly of gas and ice. This gives them their distinctive tail as they move across the sky. Because they're less dense, Alan Fitzsimmons has calculated that it would take a six kilometer wide comet to affect our climate. Such a crash would have a spectacular effect on our planet. When it was just over two days from impact, it would only be seen as a very faint star in the night sky. Now, as it approached us, as it got closer and closer, we'd slowly see it brighten and grow larger until about 30 minutes before impact, it would be about the brightest thing in the sky. And by then, of course, we believe everybody would have noticed it. But we wouldn't be able to do anything about it. Now, the time it takes for that asteroid to travel from the top of the Earth's atmosphere until it reaches sea level is only eight seconds. So we'd see this brilliant fireball, all the time, of course, making no sound because it's traveling about 20 times the speed of sound. The first sound we would hear would occur minutes after we see the huge flash of light when the asteroid strikes 
the Earth's surface and is instantly vaporized in a ginormous fireball. Could this disaster have happened without at least one civilization noticing and reporting it? No civilization at the time records any such event. In addition, scientists have found no evidence of a crater left by an impact from the 6th century. I mean, that's, that's just yesterday in, in geologic time. It'd be a big crater. We'd know about it. Certainly that happened 65 million years ago when the dinosaurs died. But I don't think it happened in the 6th century. But the lack of a crater alone does not rule out a comet or asteroid strike. 70% of the Earth is covered in water. Could it be that the impact was on the oceans? If the asteroid landed in the ocean, then the, the initial wave caused by the impact would be miles high. There would have been humongous tidal waves, big, huge tidal waves that, that would have uh, swamped the coasts for over the, the margins of whatever ocean it struck. The tidal damage would have traveled miles inland. Again, no civilization recorded such an event. And scientists haven't detected any significant interruption to the growth of coastal plants at this period. There doesn't appear to be any evidence of an asteroid or comet strike on Earth at this time. The search seemed to be narrowing down to a volcano. But could there be another extraterrestrial explanation? This time, not a complete comet hitting the Earth, but one which had fragmented and scattered throughout the atmosphere. It's a theory Mike Bailey suggested to David Keyes. Well, the bombardment event um, has been, if you like, classically defined as a large number of pieces of comet arriving in a short period of time and exploding in the atmosphere. And the model for that is the 1908 Tunguska impact over Siberia, which was a single object which probably caused about a 20 megaton equivalent size of explosion. The 1908 Tunguska event was an example of an airburst explosion. A lightweight meteor hit the Earth's atmosphere and exploded in the air. While the shockwave caused massive local destruction, there weren't enough microfine particles released to affect the weather. But Mike Bailey believes that a whole shower of cometary debris hitting in a Tunguska-style event could affect the climate. If you have a large number of those, you're going to just put a lot of material into the atmosphere, and you're going to cause a dust veil. Mike Bailey believes that it's possible to use mythology to support his theory. He's analyzed the life and death of one of the most famous legends of all time and reached an intriguing conclusion. Sixth century Britain was supposedly the time of King Arthur. All the many later legends tell that Arthur lived in the west of Britain and that as he grew old, his kingdom was reduced to a wasteland. Curiously, the legends give the date of Arthur's death as 539 or 542 AD, right in the middle of the climatic catastrophe. The legends also tell of terrible blows which rained down from the skies onto Arthur's people. Mike Bailey thinks that Arthur's death could therefore be a symbol of something that really did happen, devastation by a comet as it shattered and crashed into Earth. Then you look at the mythology, you discover that Arthur isn't just an, you know, a, a, somebody with a nice suit of shining armor and some buddy sitting around a, a round table. The origins of the stories are in Celtic mythology um, and that one of the key figures that you can trace him back to would be the Celtic god Lug. That Lug is a bright solar deity who curiously comes up in the west and has a long arm, which could well be the description of a comet. And Lug also is famous for delivering uh, these terrible blows. Could Bailey's myths hold a grain of truth? By a process of elimination, it now seemed to come down to a clear choice, cometary bombardment or a volcano, but which? David Keyes discovered that there was one hostile area of the Earth which could just hold the final clue, the polar ice caps. For the past decade, a multinational team of scientists 
has been extracting 1,000 meter deep columns of ice from Greenland in the north and the Antarctic in the south. In the same way trees put on a new ring of growth each season, the polar ice caps put on a fresh layer of snow. And in each layer is a record of what was in our atmosphere. The chemistry of the old atmosphere is in there. And even the chemistry today is changing in our atmosphere. If we combine this, we can have a record which we can compare with other records from the deep sea sediments, from tree rings, from lakes. But the fantastic thing about the ice caps is that they are directly related to the atmosphere itself. Professor Hammer's team are testing a new Greenland core from the 530s AD that has just arrived at their laboratory. If pieces of a comet or asteroid had exploded in the atmosphere, the team would expect to find traces of rare chemical elements like iridium. If there had been a massive volcanic eruption, they would expect to find an excess of sulfuric acid, the telltale signature of a volcano. The sulfates would have been hurled up into the atmosphere by the explosion and scattered by the winds. They would have then got into rain and snow to be finally stored at the poles as ice. And uh, what we are going to do now is take a piece of ice out around 5.35 after Christ. We will have to clean it a little roughly here first. We will now bring it into this setup here where it will be cleaned in the end and on all sides and then it will be cut by the steel knife so that we are not touching the core. We have to remove quite a lot to be sure that uh, we don't have any ice outside uh, contamination. The cleaned core is sliced into five centimeter lengths. Each length is then melted and analyzed. They will be measured one at a time automatically from now on and the results will show up on this computer as chromatograms. So what does the ice contain? Cometary debris or volcanic sulfates? Yeah, I can see the sulfate peak is increasing when I go to the next sample. That must be um, come from sulfuric acid in the uh, atmosphere and that's an indication that uh, there's been a, a volcanic eruption. And as the final result shows, it wasn't just any eruption. I show you here is the sulfuric acid. And actually, these huge amount of sulfate here, lasting several years, and clearly higher than anything else in, in this part of the record, corresponds exactly to this around 535. So there's no doubt it's a major eruption. The evidence from Greenland seemed conclusive. Lots of sulfates and no cometary debris. But for the eruption to have had worldwide consequences, more was needed. If you want a climatic, important, major eruption, it must show up with a large signal in both hemispheres. That is, you must see it in Antarctic ice cores and you must see it in Greenland. At the moment, information from the Antarctic ice core is less precise, but from their existing data, Professor Hammer's team already know that there is a volcanic signal in the Antarctic too. We have a volcanic signal which lasts several years. We have from an Antarctic core similar evidence as in Greenland, but not as good, not as well dated, but indicating that this volcanic eruption could have taken place. The data from both the North and South Poles is the same. A huge sulfur spike around the mid-6th century. That strongly suggests volcanic ash caused the global climate damage seen in tree rings. The idea of volcanoes causing climatic catastrophe may seem unfamiliar. But tree rings and ice cores now show that every thousand or so years, massive climate downturns have happened. The mid-sixth century event is simply the most recent. 
In fact, what surprises volcanologists is how few volcanic eruptions there have been in the last hundred years. One of the amazing things which people sometimes forget, even scientists, is that our century is one of the most quiet centuries with respect to volcanism. If you go back in time in, in 19th century and 17th century, 18th century, there's a lot of volcanoes. They come in lumps, say 20, 30 years, a lot of them. They even overlap in the stratosphere, mixing up. And uh, it's not speculation, but people do think that Turner's paintings with his uh, sunsets, it was not the, the taste of the artist to make them so red as they were but they were actually painted in a time when the real sunset looked like that. We live on this planet with over 200 active volcanoes. They may have been quiet recently, but a really massive eruption can turn the climate upside down. To create a dust veil that spreads all around the world, the eruption has to happen near the equator, as only equatorial winds can spread dust over both hemispheres. But there are over 90 equatorial volcanoes. Could David Keyes discover which one caused the mayhem of the 6th century? David Keyes began to narrow the search for the 6th century volcano. He knew that the highest concentration by far of large tropical volcanoes lies in an arc straddling Southeast Asia, from India through Sumatra, Java, the Philippines and Japan. First, he turned to the greatest civilization near this area, which was then producing written records, China. I, in great excitement, started looking to see if there was any trace of anything happening in 535. And in fact, in February 535, there's a record of a loud bang, <laughs> uh, a huge thunderous sound coming from uh, the southwest. And with this one, there was no mention of lightning or anything. It was merely a rather sort of uh, mysterious entry in which they only referred to uh, the sort of thunderous noise. And interestingly, that uh, points straight towards that um, Indonesian area where all those volcanoes are. For the Chinese to have bothered to record such a sound, it must have been an exceptional one-off event. But could the sound of a volcanic eruption have traveled the 3,000 miles from Indonesia to China? To help locate the volcano, Keyes asked experts at Los Alamos Laboratory in New Mexico to explain the physics of long-range sound travel. We know that near the volcano, the sudden explosive eruption provides a shock wave in the near field, and that propagates out, going out to thousands of miles. But as it propagates out, you lose the high frequencies, the shock, very sudden, sharp reports of the volcanoes, and all you're left with are the low frequencies that we measure in what we call infrasound, which is generally below 10 cycles per second. The long-range perception of that sound would be very low rumbling, uh, much like very distant thunder. The Los Alamos experts had said it was possible. Now, could Keyes find any written evidence from Indonesia? Unfortunately, very little writing survives from the area. But once again, he found a fascinating clue. Housed in the royal palace at Solo in central Java is a massive set of manuscript volumes called the Book of Kings, 
put together in the 1850s, but based on ancient sources. It describes an extraordinary event which took place around the middle of the first millennium AD. Today's Javanese royal archivist, Prince Puja, reads from the original text. A mighty thunder, which was answered by a furious shaking of the earth. Pitch darkness, thunder and lightning, and then came forth a furious gale, together with a hard rain. A deadly storm darkening the entire world. In no time there came a great flood. When the water subsided, it could be seen that the island of Java had been split in two, thus creating the island of Sumatra. Had keys struck gold with the Book of Kings? Geophysicists he consulted said the story accurately described a major volcanic eruption and would have been difficult to invent. But which of the many Indonesian volcanoes was the Book of Kings describing? There was a clue. The only major volcano in that specific area between the islands of Sumatra and Java is the legendary Krakatoa, the world's most notorious volcano, which last erupted in 1883. But could Keyes prove Krakatoa was the culprit? An Icelandic volcanologist, Professor Harald Sigurdsson, now working in the USA, joined the chase. He had visited the volcano many times and already knew that Krakatoa contained an ancient mystery, an eruption long ago far bigger than anything recorded in modern times. Uh, about five years ago, when we were doing research on the 1883 volcanic eruption of Krakatoa, we discovered uh, this deposit of a major eruption. And so we became very interested in this deposit, but uh, at the time we didn't have the time uh, and resources to uh, study it in detail. So what we really want to do is ideally find charcoal within this layer or charcoal immediately above and immediately below it in order to give us a date of the event. It was an irresistible temptation. David Keyes' ingenuity had led us this far. We had to go on. Channel 4 decided to finance an expedition to Java by Professor Sigurdsson. His goal, to test Keyes' theory by dating Krakatoa's major eruption. Krakatoa is part of a group of uninhabited rainforest islands lying west of Java and just south of the equator. It's also the scene of the most famous volcanic eruption of recent times. In 1883, Krakatoa blew itself apart, killing 36,000 people on the mainland. The first stop for Professor Sigurdsson and his team will be the island of Anak Krakatoa, meaning child of Krakatoa. Anak has formed entirely since the eruption of 1883 and grown up into a thousand foot high volcanic island. Each year, Anak becomes ever bigger and ever more dangerous. Now, actually, when you get up to them, these rocks are the size of houses and uh, five, six meters in diameter. And these were ejected uh, by the explosions of uh, Anak, and they travel through the air like a bomb, basically, and they fall to the ground, and when they hit the ground, they create a crater. Well, this is about as big as they come. This one must be two meters high. And what do you think, about four meters wide? Yeah, I'd say so. That's a big bomb. Yeah. Beautiful crust. Hard to, Im hard to imagine this thing flying through the air and landing here during an explosion, plunking down and, and creating this uh, crater that it sits in. This one is a good one because you can hide behind it in an explosion and take shelter. 
Uh, let's hope they don't uh, land like this today. It'll be uh, very dangerous. Anak Krakatoa is a noisy and quarrelsome child. Only two hours after the team pushed off from the island, Anak let rip, hurtling rocks and lava onto the area where we had stood. From the safety of the sea, it was possible to gaze back at one of the greatest firework shows on Earth. This activity is just part of a cycle that's been going on for hundreds of thousands of years. Krakatoa grows up out of the sea. Every little eruption adds more and more rock to the island. Eventually, it gets so large, it blows itself apart. This time, Anak continued its barrage throughout the night, on into the heat and dust of the next tropical morning. But Sigurdsson's task is to journey back in time, hundreds of years back, long before Anak Krakatoa was born. For decades, scientists have thought that Krakatoa contains a centuries-old secret. Illustrations from a 1920s book show a possible pattern. First, there was ancient Krakatoa, which exploded, possibly around 535, leaving islands behind which eventually, with occasional minor eruptions, grew back to the Krakatoa of 1883. This in turn blew up, leaving the Krakatoa islands of today. Sigurdsson's last survey of the islands seems to confirm this. Five years ago, he charted the ocean floor using sonar. The charts show the outlines of a caldera, the term for a giant crater left after a massive volcanic explosion. There's a structure out here in the ocean, a circular structure, which is much larger in diameter, and it is possible that this uh, buried uh, feature, circular feature that we see here to the north and the east may in fact be a gigantic ancient caldera of Krakatoa. Well, we must be right on the edge here. So can Sigurdsson find any hard evidence to date oh, this eruption clear. of ancient Krakatoa? Such evidence is only contained in charcoal, which is formed when hot lava instantly carbonizes trees. The charcoal can then be carbon dated in the laboratory. To get an exact date, Sigurdsson must find charcoal from the major eruption layer, which is on the islands around Anak Krakatoa. Wow. It's a vertical drop. Failing that, he could also narrow the margin if he finds charcoal in the layers above and below. Looking for charcoal is like looking for a needle in a haystack, and a lot more dangerous. And right in the middle of the, uh, this major pyroclastic deposit that is formed by a very large eruption of Krakatoa. Now this is very likely to be the uh, deposit that was created by a uh, eruption, possibly in the 6th century AD. And this is the one I'd really like to get some charcoal from, so we can date this very important event. Now, we'd be very lucky to find charcoal, but I'm going to keep digging around here a little bit and see what we got. The material in the layers of Krakatoa spans hundreds of thousands of years. Even narrowing down the date of the major ancient eruption to within a few thousand years would be a big stride forward. Often it's extremely difficult to find uh, charcoal. You might think that it would be a lot of burnt wood or, or carbonized trees here because it's a tropical environment. But many volcanoes are barren uh, because there's so much activity that the vegetation and the forest doesn't really get established. Uh, we've had a lot of problem with finding charcoal uh, in this particular deposit, but we must keep in mind that there are only small pieces of the island sticking up above sea level, so we have very small area to prospect. During the fortnight he was in Krakatoa, 
Professor Sigurdsson was only able to find 10 charcoal samples. He was unable to find a charcoal sample big enough to date from the major eruption layer. However, he was able to find good samples for the layer immediately above it and a layer a few levels below it. It will now be possible to see whether 535 falls between those dates. If it does not, David Keyes' theory will fall. Six weeks later, the carbon dating analysis is completed. Professor Sigurdsson faxes the results and an accompanying report to David Keyes. Yeah. So what's his assessment on it? That's just really good news. The results showed that the layer immediately above the major eruption is dated as 1215 AD. A layer several layers below it is dated as 6600 BC. Well, if we look at this in detail over here, then we have this picture. We have 1215 AD right on top here in, in, in this deposit. That, uh, then we have the, the major eruption. deposit right underneath it and then we have about five layers and uh, then uh, down here we have the charcoal that we dated as 6600 BC so in here we have uh, quite a, 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 a period of activity and development of the volcano possibly s several thousand years and that leads us to think that the uh, event is much closer to 1215 AD as opposed to 6600. Well, that span still covers the 535 AD event, so it doesn't rule it out at all. Uh, in fact, I think uh, as a result of this, we are focusing more and more in on that time frame. He thinks that the the, the lead period, the lead option, if you like, for when the major eruption that we're talking about took place was the first millennium AD. So although technically it can be anything between 6,600 BC and 1300 AD, all the other pieces of evidence that he's got suggest that it's actually, we can narrow that down to the period, let's say, 0 to 1,000. Our uh, 535 is uh, uh, marvellously right in the middle of that window. So I think that uh, it's looking good. David Keyes's five years of detective work suggest that there is overwhelming evidence of a massive volcanic eruption around 535 AD in the tropics. Krakatoa is now the most likely culprit. The volcano that did go up in 535 AD would have produced a dust cloud that enveloped the world. It would have been one of the most dangerous spectacles ever seen. A 30-mile-high column of ash and dust brought global climatic catastrophe. Darkness, drought, frost and famine. And ultimately, chaos and war. It was a natural catastrophe that would change the course of human history. In 535 AD, scientific evidence suggests that a massive volcano erupted in the tropics. It threw up so much ash that it turned summer to winter. Crops failed for years. Drought and famine gripped the land. Millions died. 
For the last five years, David Keyes, a writer on history and archaeology, has immersed himself in this worldwide climatic catastrophe. By consulting historians, scientists, and in particular volcanologists, Keyes has concluded that the most likely culprit was the notorious volcano Krakatoa. An expedition to Krakatoa, which lies off the coast of Indonesia, further supported his theory. But Keyes believes that the eruption, the biggest in the last 1,500 years, was only the beginning. What followed was over a hundred years of upheaval that would change the course of human history forever. So what would the volcanic eruption of one and a half thousand years ago have been like? The amount of power generated by this eruption would have been equivalent to around 2,000 million Hiroshima-sized nuclear bombs. The eruption of this ancient Krakatoa is something mankind has never witnessed, perhaps tens, hundreds of times larger than any volcano that's ever been witnessed. David Keyes asked volcanologist Dr. Ken Wallets, an expert on Krakatoa, to feed all the available data about 6th century climate change into a supercomputer to simulate how the explosion began to unfold. I will start the simulation and will show several phases of the eruption. Willets has located the eruption in the Sunda Straits between Java and Sumatra. By combining tree ring and ice core data with eyewitness accounts of the dimming of the sun, it's possible to estimate how much material might have been thrown up into the Earth's atmosphere. With that figure, it's possible to calculate the scale and power of the explosion and associated after effects. Using Willets's model, we have reconstructed the Krakatoa 535 AD Big Bang. A giant red hot fountain of molten rock and a vast cloud of ash towered over the countryside. Then, a second crack would have let seawater in. This caused an absolutely vast explosion, creating a 30-mile-high fountain of magma, dust and ash. Up to a 1,000 miles away, ash rained down on forests and fields. The towering clouds of steam and gas and ash pierced and shot upwards. And at times when it seemed like it could no, go no higher, it would continue to go high, eventually to the point where it started to block out the sun in all directions. And the gray white cloud would then start, see to sort of move laterally across the sky like a mushroom cloud. The fallout from the eruption would have been the natural equivalent of nuclear winter. So how did Krakatoa affect the world? Ken Wallets has studied Krakatoa in detail and he can see similarities between it and a huge dormant volcano near his laboratory high in the hills of New Mexico. The 15-mile-wide volcanic crater, or caldera, at Valle Grande, New Mexico, last exploded a million years ago. Ash from here landed as far away as Louisiana. Using the remains of Valle Grande, 
Ken shows how high-flying volcanic ash blocks out the sun. This is ultra-fine volcanic ash formed by Phreatoplinian eruptions similar to what we think happened in the 6th century at Krakatoa. It's so fine that even just a baby's breath of air will keep it suspended by minute turbulence. It will never fall to the earth as long as the air is moving, which of course it always does high up in the atmosphere. In 535 AD, similar microscopic particles of ash and sulfur dioxide from Krakatoa would have shrouded the whole sky, turning it endlessly gray. Temperatures dropped. Without the full strength of the sun to heat the oceans, less water would have evaporated and the atmosphere became drier and drier. As a result, there would have been progressively less rainfall. As a result, there were droughts and famines. Uh, very often at the end of major droughts, uh, you do get um, massive floods, and that seems to have been what occurred. But what fascinated David Keyes most was not the climatic catastrophe itself, but the possible effects on human civilization. I began to think to myself, well, disruption as severe as this has got to have political consequences. Because it's really the long-term consequences that I was interested in, in isolating, to see whether one big event can actually have a knock-on effect throughout history worldwide. Keyes decided to examine a series of historical puzzles of the 6th century AD. He looked at events which, from contemporary writings and archaeological evidence, were known to have taken place, but whose cause has never been properly explained. The first puzzle was the spread of a terrible disease which brought the greatest superpower of the time, the Roman Empire, to its knees. In 535 AD, under the Emperor Justinian, the late Roman Empire, based in Constantinople, was flourishing. But in 542 AD, something awful struck at the heart of Justinian's glittering empire. The horrors were described by a contemporary writer, a monk called Evagrius. With some people, it began in the head, made the eyes bloody and the face swollen descended to the throat, and then removed them from mankind. With others, there was a flowing of the bowels. Evagrius was describing a massive outbreak of bubonic plague, the first time it was recorded in history. But how could the plague have anything to do with the climatic catastrophe unleashed seven years before? Plague is a bacteria, a bacillus transmitted from infected rats to humans. The carrier is the humble flea which feeds on rats' blood. This is a flea which has had a, a blood meal and has no plague uh, organisms in its gut and you can see that it's quite, stomach's quite full and everything's fine. If we look at, uh, if we contrast this with a, a flea which is taken up some of the bacillus. We can see that the, there's a blockage here, and this uh, is brought about by a reaction between the bacillus and the flea's gut. Now, the result of this is, of course, that the, the flea can't feed properly. And they become so ravenously hungry, because they, they, they begin to starve, in effect, that they, the more they eat, um, well, they can eat and eat and eat, and they don't satisfy their hunger because their gut is blocked and so they will jump onto absolutely anything in the chance of getting a, a free meal. As the rats themselves die from the plague, the flea has an obvious new target to bite for blood, humans. And then, as Evagrius describes, the agony begins. 
Some came out in sores, which gave rise to great fevers, and they would die two or three days later with their minds in the same state as those who had suffered nothing and with their bodies still robust. Others lost their senses before dying. What Keyes found out is that scientists now know that outbreaks of plague are strongly related to changes in climate. The sort of changes that followed 535, in particular cooling, could have had a huge impact on the spread of the disease. Temperature directly affects how the plague bacteria form in the flea's gut. Well, plague um, epidemics um, are temperature related. Um, what happens is that in the, in the gut of the flea, the, the fibrin clot only forms at temperatures below 25 degrees centigrade. Above 25 degrees centigrade, the clot doesn't form and any bacillus is simply passed out of the flea with the faeces. If cooler conditions bring about the onset of the disease, did that happen in 535 AD? And if so, where? Well, according to one of our contemporary sources, the church historian Evagrius, the plague originated in Ethiopia. What we know, both scientifically and historically, is that the Great Lakes area of Central Africa is one of the oldest foci of plague activities uh, in the world, and that it would appear that the assertion of Evagrius is correct. Because Africa is normally hot, the disease is kept at bay. But if Africa was affected by the global cooling of 535 and 536, it would have been a lethal breeding ground for plague. From Africa, via the trade routes, ships, rats and sailors could easily bring the plague up the coast, first hitting the major port of Alexandria in Egypt and on into the heart of the Roman Empire. And Roman greed for one precious commodity from African elephants would only accelerate that process. In the 6th century, there was an enormous trade in African ivory. Hundreds of tons of ivory are being brought into the empire every year and being processed for luxury furniture, for luxury objects, which important magistrates would give out as gifts processed for diplomatic gifts that the empire could then use to impress his neighbours further to the north and further to the west, people who would never have seen an elephant in their lives. And it was essentially the um, uh, European and Mediterranean greed for ivory that brought the roof in. Only seven years after the climatic catastrophe in 542 AD, on the back of the ivory trade, the plague surged into Constantinople. Its impact was devastating. We had to dispose of over 10,000 bodies a day, week after week after week, throwing them into the sea off special boats, sticking them in the towers of the city wall, filling up cisterns, digging up orchards. Soldiers were forced to dig mass graves in which to uh, cast the bodies of those who had died. The impression is one of chaos and pandemonium. Constantinople, Europe's biggest city, stank for month after month after month. One contemporary writer recorded that when the number of dead reached a quarter of a million, city officials simply stopped counting. As people left the stricken city, they took the plague to towns, villages and farms throughout the empire. Untold millions died. And unknown to the empire, a second mortal threat was brewing 3,000 miles to the east. The climatic catastrophe was also having an extraordinary effect on an extraordinary people. They too would play their part in the decline of the Roman Empire. And the simple reason for this new threat was the difference between the digestive systems of horses and cows. I think that's 
an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. In the isolated plains of Mongolia, hundreds of miles north of China, something strange was about to happen. Before 535 AD, the overlords of the region were a tribe of violent barbarian horsemen, the Avars. Chinese writers recorded their uncivilized way of life. These are uh, foul-smelling uh, barbarians from their point of view. Uh, with outrageous habits. The Avars never bathed, never washed their clothing. They cleaned their dishes by having the women lick them dry, uh, all of which was uh, simply horrifying to the Chinese. But in one respect, as both Chinese chronicles and archaeological finds show, the Avars were years ahead of the competition. Finds from archaeological digs all over Avar territories suggest that they were the most advanced horsemen in the world. Their style of riding, saddles and mouth bits are still in use by Hungarian plainsmen today. And many believe that the Avars almost certainly invented the stirrup. It was this large concentration of horses that gave them a, a military edge, the latest in the military technology of that era. The horses also provided food and sustenance. The Avars drank fermented mare's milk, uh, an alcoholic beverage. So horses were central to their existence. But then in 535 and 536, the years of the catastrophe, Chinese records and tree ring evidence from Siberia suggest that the Mongolian steppe was crippled by cold and dry conditions. The knock-on effect would have been long-term, lasting decades. By 552 AD, the Avars were attacked by a people who lived in the surrounding highlands, the Turks. They had previously been ruled by the Avars. Mysteriously, the once invincible Avar horsemen were crushed. Up until now, the cause of this sudden reversal of power has never been explained. But then David Keyes had an idea. So I was very puzzled by this and um, decided to try and, uh, try and find out uh, what the mechanism was. I thought, well, maybe it's something to do with their economy. Well, the Avar economy was a horse-based one. Uh, the Turk economy was a much more mixed one involving considerable numbers of cattle. The question came to my mind, well, was there something about the way that a cattle economy works and a horse economy works, the difference between those that might shed some light on the political events, on the demise of the Avars. Keyes contacted John Milne at Macaulay Land Use Centre in Aberdeen. Milne has made a detailed study of how different animals feed and survive. Yes, these horses here are, are actually highland ponies, but in terms of the, the sort of size, uh, they're very similar to, to uh, what I believe the Avar horses would have been like. They're, they're quite similar to some of the, the, at least in terms of size, in terms of the Mongolian and, and uh, Kazakh horses that you, that you see now. Milne had done intriguing research into the difference between horse dung and cow dung. Here you can see some uh, horse dung, and you can see that the, uh, it's very fibrous, uh, which demonstrates, and it's made up of fairly large pieces of fiber, 
which demonstrates that this has not been well digested by, by the horse. Now, if you compared some cattle feces, you would see that it, it was much more uh, finely ground up uh, and, in fact, much better digested th than horse manure. Could the contrast in horses' and cows' digestive systems have made a vital strategic difference on the Mongolian steppes when, after the catastrophe, grass and vegetation were in a terrible state? Cows have a greater efficiency to digest food. They also have the ability to eat a wider range of different uh, herbage types so that they can eat, for example, uh, very rank vegetation. In contrast, uh, the horses are, are less capable of eating rank, really poor quality vegetation uh, than cattle. And in a drought situation, you, get, you would get eventually to the state where the horse was not able to eat enough food. And because it was not been able to digest it successfully, then it, it would not be able to survive. And so in those in circumstances, then uh, the avars would, would be very vulnerable. I was absolutely amazed when, when, when I found that, in fact, it was uh, merely the differences uh, between a, a, a cow's and a horse's stomach design that had probably had uh, such a major effect on subsequent history. Chinese chronicles record how in the defeat by the once subject Turks, thousands of Avars were slaughtered or enslaved. Their leader committed suicide. Most of the surviving Avars began a 4,000 mile trek westwards. Their journey, triggered according to David Keyes by the catastrophe, was about to have a huge effect on history. The Avar refugee caravan cut across what is now northern Kazakhstan, skirting the northern shores of the Caspian Sea, and on into the fertile grasslands to the south of the Carpathian Mountains, an area which is now the Balkans. And as they traveled, the Avars recovered. Their horse technology was still superior to anything they found on their route. Once again, the Avars became a conquering people, driving all others before them. Until finally, Roman writers recall how they reached the fringes of the Roman Empire. They arrive in the late 550s as refugees. Within a decade, their ruthless horsemanship, ruthless military ability is come to dominate all the tribes, all the groups of Slavs, Huns, Germans, living north of the Danube on the empire's frontiers, and having imposed their control over these groups, the Avars can then turn their attention against the empire. The Roman Empire, already weakened by the plague, was constantly harassed by Avar incursions. At one point, Constantinople was besieged by the barbarians. Rather than take over, the Avars opted for blackmail and extracted vast amounts of gold from the empire in return for not fighting. Some of it can be seen today in museums. Much of it is still believed to lie buried in the plains of Hungary. It's reckoned that over 50 years, the Avars netted in today's terms seven billion pounds worth of gold from the Roman Empire. The Avar impact combined uh, with the uh, plague and the economic problems that ensued destabilized the empire. And at the end of the day, it can all be traced back to this um, climatic destabilization of the mid 6th century, uh, which was triggered by the volcanic eruption. David Keyes believed a pattern was emerging which showed huge political consequences stemming from the catastrophe. He had already found evidence of the catastrophe's effects throughout Europe and the East, now he turned to the Americas, where he found another extraordinary coincidence of timing 
and another historical puzzle where a great city had been destroyed, but no one had ever known why. In the early 6th century, 125,000 people lived in Teotihuacan in the central Mexican plain. In 500 AD, when the city reached its peak, it really was what is called a primate city. By that I mean the second next largest city is so far below it in size that there really, you could almost say there are no other cities. I mean, that's an overstatement, obviously, but there were cities of 10,000 people, 20,000. But compared to the 125,000 here, it was nothing. So it was the only huge, large city in the entire central Mexican plateau. Then, midway through the 6th century, shortly after the 535 AD catastrophe, things began to go wrong in Teotihuacan. For the past 20 years, Rebecca's story has been painstakingly studying skeletons of people who lived in one of the city's suburbs called Clahinga. The bones provide a remarkable history of the population's health. Well, the Clahinga population has um, adults. It also has quite a few children and an awful lot of babies. Rebecca Story began to notice that in Teotihuacan's later period, the population, in particular the babies, suffered a severe decline in health. These kinds of infections that show up on the bone are long-lasting bacterial infections, and they're very common on the children. Now, babies shouldn't have infections like this. Normally, they should be born with relatively good immunological protection from their parents, their mother. But in the case of Tlahinga, we find lots of babies with already infectious reactions indicating that the health of the mothers was so poor that the children are getting sick as well. The problem with the, the very late population there around the sixth century is that overwhelmingly it is babies, children, and individuals under the age of 25. They should not be dying at that proportion. So they start to become 70% of my sample rather than the much lower 40 or 45% that they were in the earlier period. It is a population that is in great trouble and is probably collapsing. New scientific evidence suggests that the city's decline occurred around the middle to late 6th century, 150 years earlier than previously thought. For David Keyes, this redating was a breakthrough. Now, in fact, one can see that uh, Teotihuacan's fall um, really f comes straight on the heels of the climatic disaster. And I think that there's a very, very high chance that the two are, are connected. There are no existing tree rings or other evidence from Mexico itself to show whether there was a significant climate change. However, lake deposits in the nearby Yucatan Peninsula show a 30-year-long drought starting in the mid-6th century. Tree ring evidence from Chile and California shows a dramatic reduction in tree growth from the late 530s onwards. And a study of river levels in Colombia shows that the mid to late 6th century was the driest period in the last 3,000 years. The evidence throughout the Americas, combined with Rebecca Story's findings of malnutrition, suggests that Teotihuacan was gripped by a long-lasting drought, a drought which, according to David Keyes' theory, was directly linked to the climatic catastrophe and had a devastating effect on the city's supply of food. When something happens to the food supply, well, that makes people more subject to getting ill because they're not getting enough food. Then this is a very dry environment. Water had to always have to been a very important thing. And without water, you have very great sanitation problems. Sanitation would then 
lead to lots of diseases circulating through with the people and causing mortality and ill health. And that affects the productivity of a city. A city's not productive when it's people are sick. And that becomes one of the things that then say, well, no, we don't want to go to Teotihuacan anymore because it's not a good place to be. According to the latest research, Teotihuacan was finally destroyed when the people rose up against their leader, smashing their palaces and setting light to the city's biggest temple. Somebody went in there and set fire to all the roof beams and caused this, the ceiling and roof to collapse, bring down the upper walls and form a big mound of debris. And that's what happened all up and down the main street of the city. Maybe they decided that elite class that was making demands on them was asking too much that the priests who were supposedly bringing the rain and making the springs flow were no longer successful because the, uh, because the spring flow was dropping and the rains were diminishing. Then uh, they lost confidence maybe in the priestly class as well. What appears to happen is that you've got a destabilization, um, perhaps some religious and political changes, followed by a revolution of some sort and the collapse of the city, in a way similar to events um, in, in Europe, indeed, in the way that Constantinople, uh, the Roman Empire, was affected. Five three five um, disturbs the status quo and allows history to reform itself all over the world. It really is the interface between the ancient world and the world we live in today. In central Mexico, it took 300 years for a new civilization to establish itself. Throughout the 6th century, a similar story was unfolding all over the planet. Ancient civilizations crumbling, others just beginning. And according to David Keyes, one example of an emerging nation was England itself. Britain in the mid-6th century the Dark Ages. The Romans had left a hundred years earlier. In the west of the island, native British tribes, the Celts, fought to stem the tide of Anglo-Saxon invasion from northern Europe. According to legend, it was the time of the death of King Arthur. His country turned into a wasteland. As he rode thus through the land, he found trees down and grain destroyed and all things laid waste as if lightning had struck in each place. He found half the people in the villages dead. The earth no longer produced when cultivated. From that time on, no wheat or other grain grew there. No tree bore fruit, and very few fish were found in the sea. For this reason, the two kingdoms were called the Wasteland. But could the Wasteland of legend be a distant memory of a climatic catastrophe that really did hit the native British, as a result of 535? What is certain from British and Irish annals is that the bubonic plague, which had devastated the Roman Empire, finally reached Britain by around 547 AD. It entered mainly through ports on the Cornish coast, from which the British still traded with the Roman Empire. This was a significant event in the um, history of Western Britain and Ireland. Certainly, as one goes through the annals, one can find many references to plagues. One of them is referred to as the Mortalitas Magna, the Great Mortality. Another one is the Mortalitas Prima, the first plague like this. This does suggest something special. They'd never experienced the plague before. Uh, it was a completely uh, new horror 
that they, they knew nothing about, they wouldn't have understood even what was happening. Suddenly people began to develop these terrible um, pustules underneath their armpits, in their groins, and they would have died in the most terrible agony. According to Keyes, the plague changed the political shape of Britain. At this time, Britain was divided in two. In the west lived the native Celtic Britons. The east was occupied by invaders from Europe, the Angles and Saxons. East and west had very little contact with each other. The Celtic Britons traded with the Roman world. The Anglo-Saxon peoples traded mainly with their former homelands of Germany and Scandinavia. It meant that the Celts, the native Britons, were far more exposed to the plague arriving from the Roman Empire. So by the time you come into the latter part of the century, the Celtic West and centre have, been, have experienced a huge population reduction. There's a population vacuum. And so Anglo-Saxon peoples are able to move from the east, they're able to move west into partially empty lands. And uh, England was, was born. Keyes' theory is that England came about because the Anglo-Saxons were able to defeat the plague-stricken Britons. A sixth century poem tells of the defeat of one group of Celts, the men of Godothan and their leader, Maddo. He did not retreat from battle until blood flowed. Like rushes, he cut down men who did not flee. The men of Godothin relate on the floor of the hall. But before Madog's tent, when he returned, there would come but one from a hundred. Neither I. can see 535 as a watershed where you see the the forces coming into play which create um, such countries as England, uh, Spain, France, Japan, the United China. Now came the final and boldest turn in his theory. Could it be that the catastrophe was linked not just to the emergence of new nations but also to the birth of a new world religion, Islam. This is all that is left today of the Marib Dam in Yemen, at the southern tip of Arabia. But at the beginning of the 6th century, Yemen was the region's greatest power. It depended on the Marib Dam its greatest piece of engineering. The Marib was huge, 2,000 feet long, feeding into hundreds of miles of canals. But within a few years of the 535 catastrophe, climatic chaos hit Yemen. First drought, and then a succession of storms and flash floods which weakened the dam. The constant attempts to repair the dam are recorded on contemporary inscriptions. What we're looking at is one of the great inscriptions that was put up on the uh, facade of the dam, really commemorating the rebuilding in this, of, of the dam, the repair of the dam, in this case in the year 542. And it's, it's a long inscription describing all the various people who came and contributed to this. And we can pick out right in the centre here the cartouche, the symbol of the ruler of uh, the kingdom at that stage, one Abraha and there are a whole series of these inscriptions uh, for about two or three hundred years, and then they stop, which is very indicative of exactly uh, what the Arabic sources are telling us, that there was a period when this dam was broken and was not repaired again. The Marib Dam was abandoned. Its ruin was also the ruin of Yemen. 
Its population migrated to a new regional power base which emerged in its place, around Medina and Mecca. In 570 AD, the Prophet Muhammad was born in Mecca. It's in precisely that Mecca, Medina area uh, that Muhammad was based. And so it's really uh, the growth of Medina as a, um, an important political center that is so crucial in the early development of Islam. The climatic chaos had not only smashed the Marib Dam and shifted power to Medina, it also brought Muhammad's own family to prominence. The uh, Prophet's family, or the Prophet's ancestors, had um, taken it upon themselves, really, to provide food, to import food into this area and provide food for the population. And this was one of their claims to, to, to fame and to status. Muhammad's family's reputation for social concern helped his ministry take root in a time of drought, famine and the plague which had spread from the Roman Empire. I think Muhammad's message was attractive because this was a period of upheaval and disturbance. One's got this whole apocalyptic atmosphere in the ancient world at that time. There's been war, uh, there's been a revolution. The Roman Empire, which had really dominated the political scene um, for, what, 800 years, appeared to be tottering. There is a lot of apocalyptic literature from this period. There are a lot of people saying, this is terrible, the world's coming to an end, how do we interpret these disasters, what are they a sign of, and so on. The political certainties of the world were collapsing around everybody's ears. Uh, nobody seemed sure of the future. Um, it was a, a very, very unsettled time to live. All these things uh, can be traced back uh, to an extent to the uh, climatic chaos caused by the eruption of 535, and they all feed into the early evolution of Islam. Now, if a volcanic eruption in 535 could wreak all this um, havoc and draw the ancient world to a final close and really help lay the foundations of the world we live in today, what would happen if there was another massive eruption? This is not fantasy or wild speculation. While nothing may happen in the next hundred years, there are a handful of underground volcanic monsters whose arrival date is long overdue. The granddaddy of them all is believed to be Yellowstone caldera in Wyoming. This caldera is maybe twice the size of any known modern caldera, and its eruptions, which have occurred not once, not twice, but three times over the last two million years, indicate that it can, has devastated Northern America several times. Uh, besides Long Valley caldera, there's a caldera in California, which is also heating up. Uh, the ground is shaking there. Uh, there's been uh, uh, die-off of the forest by uh, noxious gases, carbon dioxide coming out of the earth. Uh, public is very concerned about that volcano. Closer to home uh, for some people would be uh, the area around uh, Naples, Italy. Sure, it's famous for Vesuvius, which has erupted many times in the past and potentially will again in the future. There is also a caldera just on the north side of Naples, underlying a metropolitan area of Campi Flegre and Pozzuoli, where thousands of people live and have lived for a long time. 
The last eruption in the Campi Flegri complex was in 1538. At that time, 3,000 people were killed by the immediate explosion. Now, 400,000 people live within the same area. The whole complex is still active and capable of major eruptions. Uh, that would be a total disaster for Italy, a major disaster for Europe and um, would no doubt have worldwide climatic repercussions uh, which would have huge implications for agriculture, uh, huge implications from a disease point of view worldwide, uh, and would no doubt have the effect of destabilizing all sorts of potentially unstable countries all over the world. It would change our climate. It would produce uh, change in the pattern of wet and dry cycles uh, for vast portions of the Earth. We're familiar with the El Nino and La Nina effects. This would be even a much greater perturbation, uh, perhaps uh, lowering the temperature, the uh, global average temperature, several degrees or more. The biggest effect for, for people anywhere is that it's going to disrupt their, the food supply. Uh, and it's going to take years to, uh, for the climate to either go back to normal or for people to uh, uh, change the, uh, the crops that they use and the, and the way that they plant them. There may not be food to import from other countries because they'll need it every bit as much or more than, than we will. And if our agriculture has failed in some way, then there just wouldn't be enough to eat. I mean, that's, that to me seems to be the logic of the situation. Now, in times past, you're right, subsistence economies, if they had low population densities, they could go to the seashore and live on shellfish. And indeed, people sometimes did that under really stressful conditions. Uh, but you can't do that nowadays. There aren't enough shellfish to go around. If we are confronted with a global event at any time in the future, um, it's not quite clear how we would cope. The whole infrastructure of civilization will collapse around us uh, due to the huge environmental catastrophe that, that would uh, happen um, because of the failing of uh, crop production, the darkening of the skies. Communications would, would be taken out, satellite communication, uh, aircraft uh, transport would uh, be interrupted very severely for a long period. That, that type of event will occur in, in the future. Well, people start to struggle for resources. I mean, and basically that means warfare. And in the modern world, it's not quite clear exactly what would happen. You either sit and starve or you get out there and try and acquire food. And there's not much alternative in a, in a really stressful situation. One of the big lessons from 535, I think, is that we're not talking about a big bang and then the world changes. We're talking about a big bang and then it takes 100 to 150 years for the new reality to actually emerge. What will happen in the future, of course, one doesn't know. But I think that um, uh, historians, uh, economists, politicians uh, should really pay rather more attention, perhaps, to uh, the ability of natural forces to change history than they do at the moment. Uh -huh.